And we're live. Thank you so much for tuning in to Pregnant Possibilities. I am Jean Schumacher, and my partner in crime is Dr. Deborah Shapiro. And today we have an absolutely special, special guest, Dr. Michael Clapper. Dr. Clapper, it has, it, he's a member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and he currently serves in, as the advisory board for the Plantrition Project and the International Journal of Diseases and Reversal Prevention. So Dr. Clapper just launched a new online masterclass in plant-based clinical nutrition with plant peer communities. Very excited about that. And even more exciting, I mean, because Dr. Clapper goes on, I mean, all of his accomplishments, I could spend hours just talking about all of his accomplishments, but I'm very excited that he's practicing lifestyle and whole food plant-based telemedicine. And he's available for consultation now through plantbasedtelehealth.com. So thank you so much, Dr. Clapper, for taking the time to be with us here today. Oh, it's wonderful to be with you. Thanks for doing this broadcast and inviting me to be on it. Thank you. Well, I, I'm so excited. First, you have delivered or helped 10 women who went through their pregnancies as vegans. Could you just talk a little bit about your experiences with that? Sure. Uh, this is back in the 1970s. And I've been a doc 45 years and I, and I did a lot of obstetrics in my first uh, 10, 15 years of practice. I delivered 420 uh, uh, babies. And of those 420 babies, 10 of them were to vegan parents. And this is back in the, in the late 70s. And uh, it was a joy taking care of these women, and I was struck by the common experience. Every one of these women, every, to a soul, uh, they all heard from their families, you're going to be, you're doing a pregnancy as a vegan with this baby, he's going to come out weighing two pounds, and it's going to be scrawny and weak and anemic, and, and uh, if, it, if it winds up in the intensive care unit, don't blame us, we told you. And they all hear this. Well, Mother Nature's got something else in store. It turns out that women uh, get all the nutrients they need out of plant-based foods. They've been doing it for millions of years. They certainly can run a healthy pregnancy on it just because they're not eating animal flesh. You still get all the proteins and vitamins and minerals you need out of grains and beans and nuts and seeds, etc. And uh, to a woman, every one of these women went through their pregnancies just flawlessly. Uh, I see so many problems in obstetrics. Women each all the meat and the cheese, no oils and the sugar, et cetera, and they put on all this weight. They develop gestational diabetes. The baby gets overnourished. They wind up with a 10 or 11 pound baby in, in their uterus if they're, that their pelvis is too small to let out. So they wind up with cesarean sections. They get preeclampsia along the way. They get their cesarean, they get wound infections afterwards. It's, it's you know, it, this, the standard Western diet is a, disaster for uh, most women who are pregnant uh, because of all the overnutrition. Well, the vegan women went through just the mirror image of that. All of them have these flawless pregnancies. They all put on a good, honest 20 pounds or so. No one got obese. There was not a hint of preeclampsia, high blood pressure, protein in the urine. All of them had, none of them had overly big babies. They all had these six, seven pound kids, had wonderful labors, uh, you know, 12 hour labors, uh, out comes the baby there. They come out with these APGAR scores of 10, which means they're really vigorous, uh, brilliant, uh, strong, vital children. Not a whit of postpartum hemorrhage, no infection. These women didn't turn a hair. And they're sitting there with these beautiful, full-size children. Uh, and uh, and after the 10th one, I have to realize that the, the family, with all their finger wagging, was just totally in the wrong direction. Mother Nature takes mm -hmm. care of these. Uh, especially they favor, the, Nature favors, favors the baby in the uterus. So they'll take nutrients from the mom's body if necessary to make sure that baby comes out well nourished. And, and they do it as long as it, the mom is eating a whole food plant-based diet with enough calories and protein, they do fine. And so all women out there who are thinking about have, doing a vegan pregnancy, absolutely you want to do that. We can, Dr. Shapiro and I have to talk about uh, you know, some of the, uh, the requirements of that, how much protein, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not that much different than, than most regular whole food plant-based vegan folks eat. So it's certainly doable. And from my experience, it is, it's, it's the way to go. So I've had very positive experiences with vegan pregnancies. 
By any chance, did you follow up with these women to see how their kids did right. along the way? Uh, well, it, it happened almost by accident. Time goes by, the, the wheels of the, the years uh, turn. I go, go into a different practice. I moved uh, to a different country. And it, it lost sight of these folks. And, but then they're still vegans, and they're still tuned into that world. And I get on the lecture circuit. And at least once a year, I met I'm, uh, before COVID time, I'm, I'm speaking at a conference, and someone will come up to me. Uh, and they have my little blue pregnancy in, in the, and the vegan diet book. And they say, Dr. Clapper, you don't know, but I bought your book during uh, when, my, when I was pregnant with my child. And I just want to introduce you to my child. And it turned out she, she's 32 with kids of her <laughs> own now. And, you know, they grow up. And, and a couple of the ones I delivered, yes, I'm still in touch with, with their parents. They did just fine. And they grow up to be strong, healthy people. It's an absolutely reasonable thing to do. And uh, life goes on through the generations on plant-based foods. It's, we are plant-eating hominids. It's okay to eat plants. Fantastic. I was really excited to hear that you had actually done some obstetrics at UCSF, where I went to school too, and Indeed. delivered babies. I but then you have. decided that um, it wasn't it wasn't the life for you. No, I I was going to practice on a Native American Indian reservation up in Northern California, just south of the Oregon border, and I knew I was going to be delivering lots of babies, and I wanted to be able to uh, a vacuum extractor if I needed to, uh, mm -hmm. and. I was just a cesarean if I needed to. And so I went to good old UCSF, and Dr. Les Laros was there, and he said, oh, well, yeah. uh, I only wanted six months of OB just to mm, cut my teeth on. And he said, sure. So I did six months of obstetrics up on the 14th floor of Moffitt Hospital there, and I yeah. delivered about 120 babies up there over those six months and got a ton of experience. And I always have a very fond memory of that I up there, obstetric uh, a uh, certificate on my wall here. Fantastic. So, uh, yes, it's a... Wow. So you remember Dr. Katz? Mm -hmm. Do you remember Dr. Katz also? The oh, yes, Dr. Elliot Katz. Yes, yeah, I sure do. <laughs> yeah, he's my people. But I have not been able to... And I was not able to get any of the perinatologists to be that enthusiastic about plant-based medicine. I've reached out to some of them. But I mean, but what's incredible about you is that you were an early an early proponent of plant-based nutrition for not only the pregnancies, but also for bait for children. And I have that book that's now out of print with Pregnancy Children and the Vegan Diet. It was published in 1991. And what made you feel so secure in saying that a plant-based diet was safe and even beneficial uh, for children, for even babies way back, you know, I, it was, it was, you were an early endorser of this. Right. Only because I was meeting vegan parents who were raising their kids as vegan. And their kids were doing fine. They're full-size, healthy, active kids. So I, I had prima facie evidence that you can do it. It can be done. I mean, you can't argue with the biology. And uh, back in the 1980s, early 90s, and there were already plant-based athletes, Real Pearl and uh, and these famous triathletes and swimmers. So I, so I knew you can run a human body on plant-based foods. And I'm uh, sure I'd be able to raise a human child on it. They have special requirements. They have smaller stomachs. And they can't, don't want to fill that up with just fiber and water. You know, so there's a few accommodations you have to make. But uh, by and large, absolutely, not only can you raise a child on a whole food plant-based affair, but you spare them so many medical travails. Uh, you know, you don't want to be the fat kid in school. You know, well, these, these kids, these vegan kids are lean and they're usually athletic. Uh, and you know, the, you watch the, these lean, healthy, active bodies. They will never, they should, they stay on their whole food plant-based diet. They should never develop obesity. They'll never develop type 2 diabetes. They should never develop clogged arteries. They should no, never develop high blood pressure. They shouldn't develop diverticulitis. Any of these common diseases, you're, you're, these kids are gifted with a free pass. Just keep those whole plant foods going down there. And they've got a long, healthy uh, life ahead of them, free of, uh, well, staying out of the clutches of people like you and me, Deborah. Do, uh, right. Uh, they, won't have, they won't spend their life as a medical patient. So it's right. a gift to raise a child on, on plant-based foods. And then, yeah, you got to be there with the bean spreads and the nut butters and the high-calorie, you know, high-nutrient-density foods. But 
you're raising a child. You, you know, it, it, you do it out of love. And it's not that hard to do. And as I said, it's a gift beyond measure what, what you're giving these children. It must be tricky. It must be tricky, though, in a, back, back in the day when you were doing this, because so many other kids were eating animal products. So, you know, kids are being sent to school with, with you know, vegan sandwiches or you know, moms are making vegan cupcakes. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you ran into any of that or if you still do, if you have any... any oh, words I still do. Oh, ab- absolutely. Um, as Jean mentioned, uh, week Sunday, we're giving our, we're starting our course, our master class in plant-based clinical nutrition. And we devote a fair amount of time to this very issue. It's one thing to talk about the science of how well the plant-based food works in a body, but how do you get people to eat it? And what about the, the kid at school when all the other friends have, uh, have ham sandwiches and, uh, and, uh, and egg salad and all that stuff? It's not easy. And you need to educate to, you know, the children about why this is happening. Every family will have a different approach. But what, but the, the children, they're down in there. There's a cord in there that uh, so many children are horrified at the thought of eating and killing animals and eating them. When, they, when it dawns on them what that fried chicken really is, what that leg of lamb, it's the leg of a lamb. And when it dawns on them, the horror so many of them feel, a lot of them uh, in their hearts, they, they you know, run the other way. Oh, I want to do that. But, you know, but society is relentless and there's huge pressures and the, and the, and the salt and the sugar and the fat tastes good and, uh, and the peer pressure is so powerful at those age. It's a difficult, a difficult thing to, come across, uh, to overcome. But, but if, you're, if it really means a lot to both the child and the parents, then you, you find ways to fortify the, the child because ultimately it doesn't matter what his school major is saying. And all, all he has to say is, works for me. And he, you know, that's all end of right. argument. He, he owes no explanation, no apologies to anybody. This is your lunch. Uh, I'm eating my lunch. Have a nice day. And, and you need to, you know, fortify your, your daughter or your son uh, against the, you know, they're, they're, the other kids just don't know it. I hate to use the word ignorant, but they, they just don't realize what they're saying and what really is involved there. And, and, and many of those kids who are, you know, waving the hamburger at them, watch 10, 10 years, 15 years later, they, when, when, the, when they read John Robbins' book or they see Forks Over Knives, they, they become vegan, you know? And they say, you know, that kid in school, Right. Uh, so long ago, you know, he was right. Yeah, I remember a vegan kid when I was 10. And, you know, that's just America in the 21st century right now. Right, right. Well, I have to say in the classroom, because I've just stepped out after 35 years of teaching high school chemistry, environmental science, biology, you know, I've seen it in the classroom. And it, over the 35 years, I mean, I don't teach the way I did 25 years ago because they can't handle it. They can't. I mean, think about this. I mean, when I grew up, I'm, I just turned 60. So I never saw an autistic child. Now it's one out of 68, according to the CDC. And I saw it in the classroom, day in and day out, from, from ADD to ADHD to ABC, EDF, whatever you want to, you know, whatever vowels you want to throw out there. And I saw it directly in the classroom. I mean, out of every class that I taught, each section, I had at least a third, if not more, of the kids dealing with major chronic issues all the time. And their parents were taking them from doctor to doctor to doctor to try and figure out what the issue was or the problem. When I'm, you know, and it took a lot for me to just put duct tape over my mouth because we know, we know it's it's the food, the food and the environmental toxins that we're being exposed to. And I did so much to try and educate as much as I could, but, you know... (laughs) There, you, there's, you, it's a fine line. Yes, it's the food. <laughs> it, you're right. It, it's been the food all along. You know, yeah. that's, what, that's what the point is. Well, yeah, that I and, and I'm, I'm a very big one on, on environmental toxins mm-hmm. and what they're doing to us. And, Absolutely. You know, mm-hmm. since World War II, we've had over 10,000 chemicals that have been introduced into the environment. And we're like walking chemical experiments. I mean, I from, from being, you know, water being fluoridated, oh, don't get me started on that, uh, you know, to everything else in between. But I see the direct impact and students knew no better than to walk into my class with a bottle of Gatorade or some sports drinks or energy drink. They know better because they will get the lecture. But I have to be careful, you know, I had to walk a very fine line yeah, about, 
you know, mm-hmm. that's not what you're supposed to be teaching, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, right. yeah, but this is going to have the most impact on them for the rest of their lives. Hello. But just going back to what I, I mean, I saw it in the classroom. I mean, oh my gosh. I mean, from, from kids with Tourette's to, to diabetes. And I had one student who followed me who reversed it. I mean, I had another student who actually went on to get her master's as an, as a registered dietitian. She's, she just yeah. finished with her master's, Look so I'm so very Good proud of her. That's but, beautiful. And when you see that happen, when you see that change, she went off of, I think, it, and it, at, at, as a teenager, I mean, she was like 15, you know, when she started taking my classes. And she was probably on about 12, 14 different medications. And she had so many severe allergies and so many severe problems. But she was, you know, a very determined young woman. And once she got off, when she went plant-based, that was it. She, she got off all her medications, all her health issues resolved 100%, and that was it. I mean, and her father had died of cancer, and so she wanted to spend the rest of her life helping people to overcome cancer through nutrition. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. and, you know, so you, you can see it in the classroom without question, and that's, I think, oh, one of the reasons sure. why Deborah and I oh, did this. Sure, so, the, no, the teachers certainly see it. One other thing how the world is changing, though, the students, unfortunately, are quite valid in their fear, their terror of the environmental future that they are facing. And when, when it finally dawns on that, it raise, cutting down the forest for beef cattle, and you, you're paying for this with every cheeseburger that you buy, when they make that connection, Oh, that there they that hits home to them, and uh, right. we've been singing the environmental song for a long time, but it's finally getting heard out there. And unfortunately, they have a good reason to be concerned uh, as, they, I, as they are now. Yeah, I hope it's not too late. <laughs> the co- the the combination of a high fat diet, of maternal obesity, of a high weight gain, along with the endocrine disrupting chemicals, it's all really damaging to the genome with epigenetic changes, and also just to to the fetus even as early as the blastocyst stage even it's incredibly and then of course to the to the gonads of the mom of the of the fetus so they were we're making epigenetic changes that are going to be carried down through generations and we're seeing neurodevelopmental disorders so yes this is this combination of the fat and you know which is not i remember them wheeling out fat in medical school you just thought it was like this big yellow blob but it's very metabolically active right with these inflammatory cytokines and interleukins one and six so very very dangerous and toxic and we have to help women to get healthy before they're pregnant so that they can really pass on the best um, genes to their children and their grandchildren yes uh, to your viewers here just to say just to emphasize <clears throat> Well, what uh, Dr. Shapiro just said here, when a woman is pregnant with a female child in her uterus, in that female fetus that's developing, her tiny little ovaries in there have all the 500 eggs that she is going to ovulate during her reproductive life. They're already in her ovaries. Well, that's the, those are the grandchildren of the woman who's pregnant. So she, so what she's eating and drinking not only affects the, the fetus she's carrying, but her, but the next generation. You know, every burger flows through her grandchildren's uh, generative cells. There, it, it's, we have such a responsibility to eat healthy while we're pregnant. No, no question. Well, and I didn't know this. You know, when mm-hmm. I was having my children, and I don't, I consider myself pretty well educated, but you know, when it comes to OBGYN, I mean, that's a whole specialty, you know, and I had no clue, you know, no one prepared me, you know, we wanted, we got married and we wanted to have a family and start it right away, but there was nothing. I mean, you'd go to the doctor's office, they would give you the blood work, they give you the test, you know, and I, I wish I had known because once I had my children, then I started to raise them as I was raised. And I did major damage to my children. I did. I, yeah. and, and I have to, and I carry, will carry that guilt with me because I was doing what I thought was right. You yeah, know, your, your mother, yeah, your mother didn't know. My mother didn't know. You didn't know. Who knew back then? And don't I know, beat yourself but I mean, up. You do the best you can with what the information you have. Yeah, I know, okay. but my kids were sick all the time and it was because of dairy. And I know that now. And I know that like my daughter developed vitiligo, you know, an autoimmune response. Again, dairy. And I know that now, but I know, you know, I will carry this guilt with me. I mean, I remember hooking my child up to a negative, my son up to a nebulizer because he had chronic 
you know, respiratory problems. Again, dairy, hello. You know, and no one asked me. No one said a word to me about, hey, what are you feeding those kids? Not once. And I wish I had known this. I mean, I think this is one of the one of the driving forces behind for me, you know, why we started this program. Anyway. Absolutely. And why the reason I'm giving our master class in plant-based clinical nutrition is to the medical students and the young doctors. It's what your patients are eating. Dairy is a major issue here. And we're going to go, but somebody needs to deliver this message to these young docs before they perpetuate another generation right, of nutritional right. ignorance upon right. their patients here. That, right. that's, uh, those are the ones that want to reach. Right. There's no time to waste. Also, the, you know, the, 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 the effect of stress on epigenetics. And uh, so I didn't know about this. And I remember patients would come to me stressed and crying during their pregnancy and ask me, I really do remember this a lot like with Jean, they'd ask me, is this having an effect on my fetus? And I didn't know. You know, I, even when I went to medical school and graduated in 89, they didn't know about epigenetics until sort of the 90s. So and they really, really in talking about the effect of stress on epigenetics and on the genome and what can happen. So now I'm learning a lot more and educating, and that's also a part of the pregnancy advantage is to deal with stress because it is so important. Something that um, Dean Ornish always talks about in his programs for reversing prostate cancer, right? Sure, yes. Uh, again, for your listeners here, the term epigenetics Dr. Shapiro is using, it means that the genes that are in our cells, on our part of our DNA, that turn enzymes on, turn enzymes off. They're not static. We, we change every meal, washes through our cells and turns genes on, turns genes off. That, that's an epigenetic influence on our, on our genes. Well, the stress hormones, when you are under stress, your adrenal glands put out a hormone called cortisol. Having lots of cortisol washing through your tissues turns on a different set of genes than not having all that cortisol there, and they're not all beneficial changes. And people have a lot of adrenaline in their bloodstream. Well, that turns on a different set of genes that may have unfortunate circumstances. So when you say how stress influences our epigenetic outcomes, that's what she's talking about, having these stress hormones in your system. We weren't meant to do that. If, you know, if, 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 if saber-toothed tiger walked in the room, you know, stress, uh, stress reaction is a good thing for a few minutes to get you out of there. But you don't want to keep that level of stress hour after hour, day after day, like we do now, worrying about where the rent is coming from and uh, I get the virus and all that. So the, this chronic stress is really harmful to our, our, our And it, not just us, it affects the next generation and yeah. the next generation after that. So well, that said. it's incredible how it affects how we know from many different studies, but the Ice Storm, for example, Project Ice Storm in Canada, that women who were under more stress had changes in the, that the children of those women who experienced more stress had alterations in hundreds of genes, genes that they coded for glucocorticoids and also the immune response. So you know, when you think about uh, the slavery and the, and the results of 400 years of slavery and then institutionalized racism, also you think about the epigenomic changes, right? Um, it's staggering. And I'm, I, we're really hoping that we can use this program to reverse it. I often hear people say that every individual is different, you know, and unique. Every body is different. And that a diet like a whole food plant-based is, can't simply be one size fits all. Do you think that there's that same, you know, whole food plant-based diet with standard supplementations like B12, you know, D3 if you need it, omega-3s, is the right prescription for just about every human on the planet? I mean, do you imagine a, a future where we take into account individual genetic differences and prescribe unique diets or supplements based on these findings? What are your thoughts? My thoughts are that we are creatures of biology like our gorilla and bonobo cousins are. We are plant-eating hominids. We have fingers on our hands, not claws. We have big long intestines for digesting fiber. Now, we, we clearly came up through the simian, the ape line of, of, of hominid creatures on this planet. Uh, and we and that heritage says we are plant eating creatures. Your house cat is a flesh eating creature. We are plant eating creatures. Is there one diet right for every gorilla? Well, it's leaves and fruits and understand what they're supposed to be. Is there a right? Is there one diet right for every bonobo? Well, yeah, it's, it's the foliage around them. Yes, that's true. Well, same with us. 
we, you know, we need a certain amount of carbohydrates and protein and fat, but it's all in the plant-based foods. And yes, that works for every human being. Uh, we all have the same length of intestines. We all have the same enzymes in our intestines, etc. Now, is there any genetic variation? Sure. And, may, and some folks might be a little better at digesting legumes than others. Some folks um, may be able to, uh, uh, may not be able to tolerate tomatoes. Uh, fine, you know, each individual has to, to find out how their own uh, idiosyncrasies in, in their body work. But by and large, a whole food, plant-based food stream works for every homo sapiens on this planet. Uh, and now there's transition issues here. Some folks, you've been eating a diet based on flesh and dairy and, and sugars and oils for 40 years every day, three times a day, and suddenly change. Oh, some folks, you know, it's like shifting your car, uh, they're not using the clutch right. And, some folks uh, may have you know, problems during, uh, during these transition times. Uh, they're easily overcome. It's not that the plant-based diet is not right for them, but it takes a while for, for the liver enzymes to change, for the intestinal mucus to change, for the gut bacteria to change. It may take a few weeks, a few months, and during this time, the person may notice more gas or a little less energy. Uh, I would tell people, hang in there, chew that food well, make sure you're eating the right foods, that you're getting enough protein with the lentils and the beans, etc. And you might need to start out with a very small amount of legumes uh, to begin with, and not to start with a big, huge bowl of bean chili and then complain that you're all gassy. Some people may have to you know, do a gradual ramp up during this transition time. But it's an artifact of not uh, that your body is different, it's an artifact of this abnormal diet you've been eating for the last 40 years of cheese and oil and sugar and meat. Yeah, I'm going to take some time. Here's karma to, you know, to overcome, to get, get past that. But that doesn't mean that this diet's not right for me. It may just uh, take a bit longer to adapt to it. But no, we're plant-eating creatures. And when we, when we uh, it, there's such validation of that when we take people with the diseases of the, of the Western diet and they're obese and they're diabetic and clogged up and hypertensive and inflamed, and you put them on that whole food plant-based diet, all three of us have seen the remarkable changes within days. The obesity starts to melt away and the arteries open up and the high blood pressure comes down and the joints stop hurting and the psoriatic skin clears up and the migraine headaches get better and the asthmatic lungs stop wheezing so much and they turn into normal healthy people right in front of our eyes. What more validation do you want uh, that is the right food for human beings? Our body is telling us that. So, uh, you know, people love to hear good news about bad habits. They want anything that lets them keep eating those steaks and burgers. Oh, I, oh, I need this. But you oh, really don't. When, when a Time magazine came out with the butter on the cover, oh, I went... Set the movement back 30 years with that I, one. I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding really? me? Really? No other animal eats, eats the, the, the fat condensed out of the lactase and secretions of a, of a large bovine. I mean, to say that that's natural and that we need it. Is, is bizarre. We need food that grows out of the ground. Right. Mm -hmm. right. All right, Deborah, you're up. Oh, this is this is topical. So we're we're in the midst of this pandemic, COVID nineteen, and our lives are, you know, we're getting used to more social distancing and mask wearing and hand washing. And the topic has actually come up in vegan circles and on social media. That's pretty divisive and contentious. And this is the issue of vaccines. Now, I don't really know the origin of the anti-vaccination movement, and I don't know if it, if it, it was always aligned with veganism or if it's because of the use of animals in vaccine development or, or in testing. But I've heard of a lot of vegans saying uh, loudly that they are not going to get the COVID-19 vaccine, and it does seem worrisome to me. So I was just wondering, pregnant women, I'm an obstetrician, so pregnant women are advised, recommended by the CDC to get the flu influenza vaccine every year. And I'm pretty sure that when there's a COVID vaccine, they will, um, they will want pregnant women to also get this. Do you, what are your thoughts about veganism and vaccines? If you, do you? Right. Oh, the, wow. <laughs> we have another hour to, to talk here. Uh, it's a complex question, but, but to cut to the chase here. I'm not against the concept of vaccines or vaccinations. I've, in my career, I've seen three cases of clinical tetanus. It's no joke. 
that 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 disease put these three people on respirators for a week until they were able to breathe again. Damn near killed them. And so I don't have any problem getting a tetanus shot. Or, you know, I used to get one every summer before we went up to our farm. And so the, the idea of vaccination, I don't find abhorrent to me. And uh, and the people who do, well, that's the end of the discussion. There's nothing more to say to them. But again, I'm not. It's always of concern when you're injecting live organisms, the, the attenuated polio virus that wound up causing a fair number of cases of virus, those cause, cause me great concern. But tetanus is just a fragment of a protein, of a toxin that the bacteria, really, there is nothing infectious in it. Uh, you can't get tetanus from the tetanus toxoid injection. As long as we're talking about vaccines that are made of fragments of the organism, that are not live organisms. I'm not, uh, you know, I have much less anxiety of, uh, about it. And that's where I think a lot of the confusion has come from. Because, again, back in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, they're right. They, they were developed on monkeys and monkey kidneys. There was a lot of animals involved. They were uh, re- cultured on duck eggs and chicken eggs. There was a, it was an animal-heavy process. And I could see where the ethical vegans were. I don't want anything in part of that. Too many animals suffered for that. But, but fast forward to the 21st century now, and now these are computer-designed proteins that never saw the inside of an animal. They are putting these together mathematically and inside uh, very powerful computers here, and they're done with fragments of synthetic proteins, the, the, and, and they're, they're tested in many cases on computer chips to see uh, their structure, et cetera, et cetera, rather than animals. So a lot of the objections that people had originally have evaporated. Science is taking care of that. Not out of altruism for the animals, but it works better. They can do it faster and better without the animals. And so that's why they did it. But the animals benefited from that. So on that score, on my concern about the animal use in developing vaccines is way, is way down as well. So mostly, I don't have those same objections. Will I get that vaccine? I'll consider it. Now, I'm concerned in many cases you get a new drug or a new technique or a new vaccine comes out and it's used and then a year later, five years later, there's the big oops, you know, uh uh-oh, and we didn't know it caused autoimmune disease. We didn't know it caused liver toxicity, whatever. And so I may wait a few years before I actually get it myself. But uh, again, without being braggadocious, I'm a lean, healthy vegan guy. If I do get the virus, I'm, I bet my life that it's going to be a couple days of achy, fluey feeling and a sore throat, and then it'll be over. And, and that's the best insurance, rather than get into this whole thing about the vaccine. Get yourself a plant-based diet, get yourself lean and healthy, uh, get rid of your diabetes, get rid of your high blood pressure, get off those medications. And the virus becomes much less fearsome. Uh, and... Uh, so um, so the vaccine will come out. Uh, I'm going to watch it and, and see, uh, see how, how it un- unrolls here. But it doesn't cause me a lot of personal anxiety uh, because uh, I'm not going to get it for a while, and I don't think I need it at this point. Thank you. That's so reassuring. That's actually very reassuring and very understandable. It's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying all of that. Thank you. They are just using fragments of the RNA, I believe, right. of the spike protein. So there's not going to be any live... I'm so excited, you know, good friend of mine, Anthony Mazziello started this and I'm so excited because, you know, for me as a plant-based coach, I can't deal with medication. So it's great to have someone, you know, that they can connect with and do the blood work and let's look under the hood and see what the issues are. Let's fine tune your diet, but then tweak it so that, you know, that they can join a program like, you know, the, the pregnancy advantage. And, and I'm so excited. I mean, this is so needed. And I know they're up to, I don't know, I think 38 states, something like that. Plus they're going yes. for Canada. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. I'm excited about that. So you've, you know, people can sign up to, yeah, you know, to talk to you and schedule it. And they also can sign up to get your medical capsule newsletter mm-hmm. by checking your website. That's drclapper.com. Mm -hmm. Would you like to share some of your experiences with like medical students or faculty or have you found people receptive, enthusiastic, or do they still doubt the science? Oh, thank you. Important questions. Uh, First of all, with the plant-based telehealth, it's uh, 
it's, it's been so remarkable to watch the COVID thing roll through our society and so many people have gotten flattened, but some people, uh, some activities have actually gotten a boost off of the reconfiguration of our society. And one of those things happens to be telemedicine. It's gotten a tremendous rocket boost uh, because uh, obviously uh, you know, no risk of viral infections. And so I've been do- I had been doing more and more telemedicine. But as a plant-based guy, you know, the public has a uh, certain expectation of uh, talking to a doctor. If they just got a sore throat, that's fine. But I really want to talk to folks who want to get into plant-based medicine to get themselves healthier. Well, it turns out that Dr. Lori Marbus and Dr. Chris Miller, two other plant-based physicians, had started plant-based telehealth. That you can go to plantbasedtelehealth.com and uh, find the website and they invited me into the practice and so the three of us and as you said we've got medical licenses in 40 states now and we can do international calls without a problem if you're in canada or in europe uh, you can make an appointment with us and so it's very reasonably priced and we we, you're talking to a doc who won't cluck their tongue when you tell them that you're plant-based or we'll wag our fingers we promise we'll sure you on so uh, right. again, it's plantbasedtelehealth.com. Before I, I joined them, and I still am very active in our, our initiative called Moving Medicine Forward, and it's to get the uh, message into the heads of these young med students and the young professors that plant-based nutrition is the most powerful therapeutic tool they have in their armamentarium. Don't ignore this. And when you're, when you're in the exam room with the patient, you're, you are, it's never just the two of you. It's, it's the patient, it's you, and the patient's diet doctor is sitting is with you because that's why they're sitting in front of you, obese and diabetic and hypertensive and clogged up and inflamed. It's not bad genes or it's not because their LDL is too high. It's what they're eating. And somebody needs to tell the students that. I wish 50 years ago when I was a first-year medical student, somebody had told me that. It would have changed the entire arc of my medical career. It would have changed every diagnosis I made, every treatment recommendation I made. So we've been delivering this message to the medical schools. I've been going around the country to the medical schools. And it's easier now because in every med school class now, there's 20 or 30 students. They've seen movies like Forks Over Knives. They've seen What the Hell. They've seen Cal's Food. The light's on. These kids know that there's something up with nutrition here. And they are hungry, pun intended, I guess, for the information. And so I've been giving a series of lectures. If people would like to know what I tell the medical students, go to my website, drclapper.com, and click on the, on the video, What I Wish I Learned in Medical School About Nutrition. And it's, it's me at a medical school delivering that message, and you'll see what I tell the students. But if you'd like to get into it more, then sign up for our master class. Again, go to my website. You can sign up for our master class. And it's 12 lectures uh, over every two weeks. Uh, we're going to do one on clearly cleaning out your arteries and calming down Crohn's disease and raising kids and healthy pregnancies and all these topical issues of plant-based nutrition. We're going to be talking to them from the clinical point of view. So get that message to the med students that way as well. But the public is, will get a lot out of it as well. So I signed up. You signed up, great. Okay, Uh, uh uh-oh, I better be good. Uh, I had some harsh critics of the audience (laughs) there. I better deliver something worthwhile. Uh, I think you'll find it worthwhile. You always do. Yeah, you're a wonderful speaker. How are are they receiving your message, the students, you know, that that you talk to in the colleges? (laughs) It's, it's, it's very interesting when I, when I give a lecture and there's, you know, used to, be, used to be 300 students in a lecture hall, about four, over half of them are really open. As I said, they've seen the film, they've talked, they've, they're, they're aware of it. And they're, from the environmental point of view, they are aware of the meat issue here. And the, and the idea of getting along without meat, tell me more, Doc, how can I do this? So they're, about half of them are really open. About a quarter of them... They, um, they, they, don't, they don't quite know, they're new to the message and they're not quite sure what to do about it because it goes against what everybody from their mother to their professors are telling them. And then in the back, there's always the, the older docs with their arms folded, you know, clucking their tongues that I, I would do radical stuff. I'd never do, do, tell this to my patient. And it's sad because they're, because they're withholding information that could change their patients' lives, that could save their patients' lives. And, in the Statement of Ethics of the American Medical Association, it says the physician is obligated 
to keep abreast of the latest advances in medical science and share this information with your patient. We are mandated to share this information with patients. It, that's in their statement of ethics, and therefore it's unethical to withhold this information from our patients. And so those old docs who are with their arms folded, they're gonna get pushed out of the way. Uh, life marches on and the young students are, they become professors real quick and they hopefully will have the lights on as far as plant-based nutrition goes. And, and I want it to become commonplace where now I hear so often patients come back, I wish my, I wanted to talk to my doctor about nutrition, he laughed me out of the office, he didn't want to hear about it. Uh, I want to get it so people are saying, of course my doctor asked what I was eating. Oh, we, we talked 20 minutes about my diet. He really wanted me to increase the amount of plant protein in my diet. That's what I want to hear coming from patients and we're working hard to make that happen. Fantastic. And this is the Plant Pure community that's also, or PCRM, yes. are you, what are you working with with this? Right, the Plant Pure community. This is um, Dr. Colin Campbell's son, Nelson Campbell, and his wonderful Plant Pure Nation. And he's got the, the uh, interest groups, the pods uh, sprinkled around. Well, they stepped forward and offered to partner with us. And they're providing the, the office help, the, the accounting help, the, uh, the things that uh, way out of my ken. Uh, they were just angels. They, they saw that, we're, Doc, we want to help you. What you're doing is, is in the right direction. Let, let us give you a hand here. And so they've been very, very helpful and positive in, in providing administrative help and accounting and the computer help, etc. So I'm very appreciative to uh, Nelson Campbell and the whole uh, plant pure community crowd. They're, they've been angels. They're great. The whole family is amazing. And I just want to share with you, going back to what we were saying about animals and how much land they take in and clear cutting, his sister, Leanne Campbell, has a place down in Dominican Republic. And she's got two acres of land. She used to be a Peace Corps worker in Dominican Republic, you know, long time ago. And she ended up going back and buying land. And next to her, she has two acres of land and it's all farming. You know, she grows, I think she said, I think it's 40,000 pounds in two years of food on her two acres. And next door, they have clear cut everything for the cattle. So it takes two years to raise the cattle on grass fed on the two acres. So one cow, 400 pounds when they go to slaughter versus her 40,000 pounds of food. Mm. So she mm. started a project called Global Roots. And so it, amazing mm. what she's doing down there. Amazing. And she has educational classes come through and, you know, educating people. It's just incredible. So an amazing family, just truly amazing family. Indeed. If people go to my website, drglabber.com, and click on the video, Food for a Livable Planet, oh, we go into this very thing that Jean just talked about, how much, how much more food you can grow on an acre of land if you just grow plants for people to eat directly rather than feeding it to an animal. There's more than enough land to feed everybody an abundant plant-based diet on this planet. And then plus allows, so you have so much land left over, the forest would come back. As the trees grow, they take carbon dioxide out of the air. They stabilize the soil. The waters run pure. It would heal this planet as well as heal the people, it would heal the animals. On every level, a plant-based diet is, is our self salvation. It's what we, you know, humans are being told, asked, invited, an individual basis if you want to be healthy, and as a species, you want to survive. Adopt a plant-based diet already. That's your ticket uh, to a livable future. Right. Well, Dr. Shapiro, I think we have time for one more question. That one's yours. No. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, well, I, you might have touched on this a little bit, but I just want to throw it in there because I know there are still people like those doctors in the back that are sitting yep. like this. They're saying, well, I tried it and I felt terrible. I was weak and I couldn't do any, I couldn't run. I couldn't do what I wanted to do. And then I needed some, I knew I needed meat. I ate a little meat. I ate meat and I felt so much better. So I just know this just, it might work for you, but man, it does not work for me. I've heard that. Oh, absolutely. And so have I. We all have, of course. So here's what I think, theory, but I think it's pretty close to what's happening. Again, uh, the body does the best it can with what it's fed. And at age six months, uh, when the baby's still at the breast, with all the love in the parents' hearts, my mother didn't know, your mother didn't know, with all the love in the parents' hearts at six months of age, that jar of baby lamb, baby chicken, baby turkey is opened. 
And at that point on, for the rest of that baby's existence, three times a day, animal flesh is slathered on that child's intestinal tract, all through infancy, uh, through toddlerhood, through childhood, through adolescence, through puberty, three times a day, they're in McDonald's, they're eating their Happy Meals, or through their teen years, their 20s, their 30s. Well, you eat animal flesh three times a day for 30 years. Your body's going to adapt to that. The, the enzymes in the liver will be the most efficient for metabolizing the cholesterol that's coming out from the gut. The gut intestinal mucus will be the most efficient for absorbing minerals from a, from a flesh-based food stream there. The microbiome will reflect an animal-based food stream. The body is, gets used to these metabolic necessities. And very importantly, we're eating, when you're eat, chewing a chicken breast or a, a, a steak, you're eating the muscle of an animal. Well, uh, as you eat the muscle, uh, the muscle-related nutrients that make up that muscle, the carnitine, creatine, myoglobin, etc., cetera, uh, flood into your system. Well, our body makes these molecules. We make our own carnitine, we make our own creatine, we are, and hundreds of other muscle-related nutrients. Um, and your body can make that, but if those nutrients are coming in preformed three times a day, every four hours, you're, you're flooding the body with carnitine, creatine. Well, what do you think your, your genes are gonna do? They're gonna downregulate. You say, hey, we don't need to make a bunch of carnitine, that we don't want to, it, it turns into a TMAO and other nasty things. So, so what does your body do? It downregulates your own production of carnitine and creatine and myoglobin, all these things, because it's coming in preformed uh, with your meals. Well, that works as long as you continue that same food stream. But then at age 30, you go, you see forks over knives or you hear a podcast like this and you go plant-based. Most folks can make that transition without a problem. But I'd say a significant 10, 15, 20% of people, maybe it, it takes them a while before they can gear up their own carnitine production to, to a sufficient level, their own creatine production, their own myoglobin production, their own... Now, and again, those are just symbols for hundreds of, of muscle-related nutrients that, that it may take a while for the enzymatic machinery to gear up. And during that time, uh, gee, I don't have the energy I used to as they're drawn down on their own stores. And then they eat a piece of meat and that on those preformed muscle nutrients again flood through their tissues. Oh, I feel better. Wow, vegan, vegan, I'm a carnivore. Mm -hmm. but, but what have we witnessed? This is not normal human physiology. This is an acquired dependency mm -hmm. that was created by feeding a human infant animal flesh three times a day since infancy. Yeah, you can create a dependency. So what? Yeah, and without being too dramatic or pejorative, yeah, a heroin addict, can get, you get dependent on it and you get withdrawal symptoms when you take it away. Mm -hmm. Is that not similar to what we're seeing? But this is not normal human physiology. These lovely vegan kids they grow up as vegan since birth. They don't have meat cravings. Uh, their mouths don't water when they walk past the barbecue. Right. Uh, they, they grow up big and strong and, and free of meat on, on every level. So just because we are capable of creating this artifactual dependence upon animal flesh does not mean that's our normal diet and that we need it. And in fact, the more we eat, the more cancers we get, and the more clogged arteries we get, the more inflammation we get, the more diseases we get, the sicker we get. Uh, you know, and he can say, I need my meat. But no, you have a dependency upon this. And, and, it, and people need, some folks may need to wean off slowly. It may take them six months or a year. And they may, to eat, may need to eat a little bit once a week, just medicinally. And I don't begrudge them that. Now, once a week is sure better than three times a day. If everybody on this planet got their meat eating down to once a week, I'd be a happy doc. Yeah, yeah. This planet would be happy. I'll take that. Be, I, don't stick, I don't have to be a sickler vegan or nothing. Just, mm -hmm. you know, the less animal flesh you eat, the better, and none is best. But some folks may require a taper off. It's okay, but that no way invalidates uh, the, the basic metabolic truth of a plant-based diet. Fantastic. I love when I heard you speak about that and using meat, uh, animal products medicinally to get past that until your body can ramp up and understanding how, how your own body's uh, metab uh, uh, the ability to make these products have been downregulated. People need to, need to know that. We can make everything we need. We make all the cholesterol we need. People say, oh, you, you, know, you make all the cholesterol you need. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. And, you, and you stretch out the time instead of eating it once a week, once every 10 days, and once every two weeks. Or, you know, just stretch out the time till finally, ah, I stop buying the stuff. 
It was usually Fantastic. where people wind up. And they I don't... also think it's some of the toxins that people are releasing too. Mm. That once you start to go plant based and you start to burn off some of the fat that you've got, the, you got toxic dumps in there that have been yeah. storing oh, a lot of these chemicals. Toxic, absolutely, toxic stuff, no doubt. Oh they yeah, feed those animals and what? Oh, what they spray on the grains and the pesticides and herbicides and antibiotics and growth promoters, hormones, leukemia viruses. Oh, it's toxic. If, if people yeah. really understood what's on their plate. Uh, they, we gotta have a, we'd have a lot more vegans, but that's why we're we're trying to get this information out. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You're so mm -hmm. wonderful to listen to. Yeah, we I was could, so we honored. Could, yeah, I was so honored when you came to speak at my hospital. It was uh, it was really incredible. And then when I got to follow you up at True North, and it just, yeah. it's just such an honor to to know you. Uh, and, well, thank you, Deborah. Definitely okay. mutual. It's so great to have an obstetrician uh, speaking these truths. The more vegan children, the more confidence you can build in the moms mm -hmm. and in the kids, because that's where the hope is. It's in the next generation. And, and I'm so happy that uh, you are who you are doing what you're doing. So, yay, we're, we're all, everybody's talents are needed. And Gene, you're such a great, great advocate and a great uh, educator it's a matter of education we need we got enough science studies we need to educate the public now and and you guys are doing a great job with that it's, it's been an honor to uh, to help your efforts thank, thank you, so, you much. so much thank you so much for being thank here you. today it's been a pleasure truly and an honor bye everyone happy healthy life stay safe you too. okay bye, bye stay safe be careful